glad that one of the hallmarks of the kingdom of Jesus is authenticity. You don't have to act like you're happy when you're sad. <clears throat> you don't have to pretend that everything makes sense. You don't have to act like you understand God, and you don't have to explain all of his ways. You can come and be with other strugglers, right? You can come and be with other strugglers. I asked you last week when, when I got ready to pray, how many of you just came in here with a heavy heart today, and about half of you raised your hands, and I'll bet, I'll bet most of the other half thought it was a hypothetical question, so they just didn't raise their hands. I asked the board <clears throat> this week when I met with them, how many of you are coming in here with heavy hearts? And I just went around the room. I said, I want you to tell me what's pressing on you so I can pray for you. And uh, I, don't, I don't remember if we conducted any business, any, any votes or spent any money in the board meeting, but I know that we prayed. And we asked for God to come and to take care of, of, of our hurts and take care of us. And we prayed for all of you. And so I just want you to know that if today all you could do was kind of get through those first songs, if you had to clam up when you said, uh, you give and take away, still my heart will choose to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. It's okay to clam up when your heart just can't quite eke it out. Uh, I want you to know it's okay that if all you could do this morning was listen to that familiar refrain of the old rugged cross and just cry in the presence of Jesus or maybe all your crying is, uh, is spent, and now you're just numb in the presence of Jesus. You don't have to fake like you are into worship today. You can just honor God by being quiet before him. And it's really okay if you just need to get through the sermon and not necessarily get anything out of it today. I just want you to know that your faithful presence honors God. We've learned in these last few weeks that you, you can, the disciples of Jesus are these wholly devoted followers and servants who do three things that really characterize their lives. They connect, they grow, and they serve. And we talked about how we, we connect with God in this, in this initial experience that Jesus himself called being born again. It's not the way the culture says it, born again. It's, uh, it's not a title for a kind of Christian like Methodist or Nazarene or Catholic, the born agains. It's, it's the reality of what happens in the life of a person who comes to believe in Jesus enough and what he was saying, to dare to try to reach out to the God of this universe, believing that Jesus will stretch the distance between your hands and God's hands and connect the two of you in a deep and loving and lasting relationship. And that is like having a whole new kind of life. And that's why Jesus said it's like being born again. And if you have not yet experienced that thing, if you believe some things about Jesus and you say, well, I'm, I'm going to become religious and go to church, we want you to know we welcome you. But we also welcome you to seek God himself. And if you dare to reach out to him, in just the, the littlest bit of faith, honestly, that's all the faith that any of us have. If you'll dare to reach out to God with just the littlest bit of faith and say, man, I want to connect with you. I want to I know that kind of life that Cliff's talking about, that you were talking about, Jesus. I promise you, he never plays hide and seek. He never plays uh, dodgeball. He's always trying to connect with you. The second that you turn his direction, you will see that he's been running toward you for a very long time with his arms open. And if you haven't yet experienced that, you don't know how to and, and, and uh, would like to, if you'll come see me at the end of this service, I will introduce you to God in a way that you will experience a new birth in your life. We've also been uh, studying over the last couple of weeks that that uh, the, the followers of Jesus, these disciples of Jesus, they connect with God initially in that moment being born again, but also taking time weekly to do what we're doing. And so uh, once again, I just want to tell you that, that if you came in the doors and, and something in your heart is saying, eh, you're just going through the motion, sometimes showing up is all a person can do, and it isn't, quote, going through the motions. It's the stuff of faithfulness when all that it takes, when, 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 when it takes everything that you've got 
to just go and be with God and with his people. That constitutes faithfulness. And it's a connection with him. Whether you can feel it or not today, he is connecting with you and is giving you his grace, is giving you his mercy, is giving you his love, and giving you a renewed dose or portion of that new birth kind of life. If you can't feel it today, I'm, I'm just going to tell you I can. And trust me until you can. We also know that the the disciples of Jesus learned this, that the disciples of Jesus saw in Jesus this daily kind of connection with the Father where he would leave others and just sometimes early in the morning, sometimes late at night, sometimes all night until the next morning, we read in the life of Jesus, that he was just going to go and and disconnect from people and connect to the Heavenly Father. I hope that you're beginning to put some of those things into practice in your life. The disciples of, of Jesus connect with God. And we also connect with other Christ followers, and we talked about that last week, about how there's this family that God wants you to be a part of. He's been building it from all of eternity past. He created us so that, bearing his image, being like him, we could live in the same kind of close-knit, holy communion that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have lived in for all of eternity past. You get to be that close to God because Jesus in his dying prayer, dying wish John chapter 17 read it if you haven't he said father I want you to make them they're one with me already and I want you to make them one like you and I are one as close as Jesus and the father are that's how close Jesus wants us to be with him and with one another listen if there's anything you can do to give a person their dying wish I think you ought to and there's something that you can do to give Jesus his dying wish is to quit holding your church family at arm's length, to quit keeping a cordial relational distance. Listen, we may have to physically distance ourselves to be safe, but your hearts can go where your body sometimes cannot. And uh, if you want to make Jesus' dying wish come true, decide to dive into relationship with the other disciples of Jesus. Life groups are a great way to do that if you want to find out how to connect with any of the variety of life groups. We've got this as Pastor Wes Hirschberger right down here, and he can help connect you. The disciples of Jesus also, however, connect with pre-Christian people. And I know that this is, uh, if you've been around church much, this is the point in in the series where you think, oh man, Cliff's going to turn into preacher up there, and preacher's going to tell us that we should be out there winning people to Jesus, sharing the faith, and if we don't, then we're in trouble with God and maybe aren't real Christians. Well, that's kind of what I'm going to preach today, but um, not, not exactly. Um, the Bible, and, and the reason is this. If the Bible says that, then I should tell you, right? If the Bible says, you ought to be out there winning people to Jesus, then I should tell you that, Right? Well, the Bible has better things and more things to say than you ought to, you should, or you must. The Bible paints pictures for us that begin to connect with our hearts instead of with our shame. And I want to connect you with with some of the things that the Scriptures have to say about the people of God, born again by the Spirit of God, and connected with the people of God, can do to connect with people who do not yet know Him The Bible has a a lot better things to say. It doesn't ever use the language of you should be winning people to Jesus as though it were a contest or a debate. And I think when we've heard the word win, we have many times thought, oh, if I can out-argue them, if I can know more, if I can prove to them that God exists, if I can learn enough about the Bible that I can just overwhelm them with facts, if I study, uh, oh, let's say, origins and the creation of the earth, and if I can get really, really uh, informed about uh, creation versus evolution or something like that, then I can just be the person who, who presents so much information that they are helpless in the wake of it and overpowered by all of the facts. They will just fall on their knees before God and worship him. Um, that doesn't happen. And the Bible never tells us you ought to be winning people to Jesus. The Bible also never tells us that we are supposed to be out there converting people because conversion is really a word that has to do with uh, the outward stuff of religion. 
And you'll remember, if you've read much of the life of Jesus, that every time people started getting really interested in the outward stuff of religion, they seemed to lose sight of the inward stuff of faith. And as soon as they lost their grip on faith, religion changes from beautiful to abusive. And so Jesus already knew there was enough religion in the world. He didn't come to found a new one. And so he never told us we're supposed to be out there converting people to our religion, trying to talk them out of their religions, which are clearly inferior to ours. Hmm? He never told us that we're supposed to be out there dismantling their religions or their connections with people of other religions. Those are not the things that that Jesus commanded his church to do. When he got ready to ascend back into heaven, having done everything the Father sent him to do, what did he say? He said, make disciples. Make disciples. That's what he has called us to do. And as we've kind of unpacked the business of, of what a disciple is, it's a holy, devoted follower and servant. Let's get that up there. Say it with me. A disciple is a holy, devoted follower and servant of Jesus. One more time to work it into your brain. A disciple is a holy, devoted follower and servant of Jesus. As we've learned what those words mean, we've come to understand the definition of the word love, right? And you remember, I didn't make a slide for this this week. Love is, but we're gonna, we're, you're just going to learn it. You're going to recite it in your sleep. You're going to wake up in the middle of the night saying, love is a demonstrated preference for the well-being of others over and above myself, even at great personal expense by the help of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to do it one more time because I've learned it. But love is a demonstrated preference for the well-being of others over and above myself, even at great personal expense by the help of the Holy Spirit. And love is the thing that Jesus called us to do. He called us to love the other, to, to love God and to love the other disciples so completely to actually prefer the well-being of all the other followers of Jesus over and above myself that the world takes a look at us and goes, dude, you're different. Lady, I don't know what your thing is, but you are not like everybody else I know. And and as we draw their attention by our intense, feverish, committed, demonstrated love for the other followers of Jesus, people start asking questions. And then Jesus' friend, Peter, uh, after he got, got done being a young man who shot his mouth off all the time and had to be corrected by Jesus, but suffered for Jesus for about three decades and grew up and matured, he came back and he wrote two letters late in the Old Testament. And that guy, that that wise old disciple of Jesus said, just be ready. You don't have to go out and win. You don't have to go out and convert. Just just love. Just prefer the well-being of the disciples over yourself and then be ready. Be ready for what? Just be ready to answer the people who ask, why are you so hopeful? Man, that sounds, doesn't that sound a whole lot more beautiful, attractive, and doable than, hey, you gotta learn the whole Bible, you gotta be able to out-argue the best arguing friends that you've got, and hopefully beat them into submission so that they come to Jesus as slaves to the truth? Uh, Frankly, uh, that's what I thought it was when I was young, and because I'm fairly good with words, uh, I, 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 I chased that. And it won zero people, and it converted zero people. But when I learned to finally get over myself, when I learned to actually prefer the well-being of others, I could, I could pursue the well-being of others because I, I had learned I could trust God to take care of me so I didn't have to take care of me, when I, started, when I learned that lesson, I finally started preferring the well-being of others. Uh, people started asking me, dude, what makes you different? And I was able to tell them that I have been born again by the Spirit of God, and it changed me from a selfish man into a man who enjoys giving his life away. And so Jesus just said, love each other intently. You don't have to hide it. You don't have to make a big show of it. Just authentically, right? That that hallmark of the kingdom, authenticity. 
Just authentically love one another and be ready. Because when you do, people are going to ask you, why are you so hopeful? When they ask that question, you can answer them about being born again and connected with him. And then you'll get to do the Great Commission, which Jesus said was making disciples of them. You and we together will take those folks who've asked, your, asked the question of you, uh, and we will introduce them to Jesus, and we will help bring them along in the faith until they too are wholly devoted followers and servants of him. But in order for people to ask you about the hope that you have, and remember that's what Peter said, just be ready to answer anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have, you have to have a hope and it has to be visible. Do you remember the day that you were born again? Now, some of you uh, grew up in different traditions, and you have loved Jesus for as long as you can remember, but you don't remember the day that you were born again. Don't worry about it. There's people who say you have to know the date. You have to write it down in your Bible. I've been to churches where the pastor said, if you don't know, then write down today's date because you'll know the date. That's just ridiculous. Okay? That's just ridiculous. Listen, if your mom and dad lost your birth certificate, you were still born. I mean, not still born. You were... You were born. We can prove it by just walking over to you and throwing an arm around you, right? If you know the life of God within you, you have been born again. Don't get hung up on, on dates like that. But do you remember what it was like when you first knew the love and the light and the life of Christ within you? How, how it, it stirred something in your heart so that you had this hope. And the hope was that you were actually going to get to know Jesus more and more deeply. You'd get closer and closer to him. And that crazy thought that over the course of your lifetime, you could become a lot like him to the place that people could believe there was a Jesus because there's a you in this world. Do you remember having that hope? And you actually thought he could do it because you, you felt what it was like to be delivered from the guilt of your sins and to have your, your, this, this buoyancy of spirit born within you. Do you remember that? There was a hope not only that you could become like Jesus, there was also a hope that you had, you had finally found a relationship that would last forever ever, that no matter what, that other person was not going to turn their back on you. They were not going to betray you. They were not going to hurt you like, oh, virtually every other human relationship had ever done. Do you remember that hope of I found somebody that I can really trust with me, the real me forever? And do you remember the hope that he's going to walk with me through this life and one day, everything that I've ever believed in will not become, will, will, will be transferred, translated from a belief into my very real experience. And I will walk into the unfiltered presence of God in his heaven. You remember that hope? Hey, listen, we've been saddened this week. That's okay. But listen to me. Curtis Mayer and Linda Mayer received the goal of their faith the salvation of their souls, and they are with Jesus, and everything that they ever believed about him has now been proven to be true. They've received the hope, the great hope of the church. You see, in order for people to ask you about your hope, you have to have one, and it, and it needs to be visible. But I know how life works. Lots of things fade. Now, I'm going to tell you something about me that is just plain weird, okay? Laura, this is not about you. It's about me, but it's probably going to embarrass you because I am me, as you know. I have this thing about blue jeans. I buy them a certain color. I've got them in several colors, but I buy them a certain color for a reason. I want them to be that color, and if you wash them a bunch of times, they will fade and become a different color. So, I never wash my jeans. <clears throat> Sometimes I put them in the freezer to kill whatever that is that's living in them. But uh, I never wash my jeans. 
And in fact, I was leading worship at this pastor's gathering a few years ago, and afterwards I was sitting in a, in a chair, and this guy comes up to me, and it was really creepy, because um, I, was, I was sitting in the chair, and he comes in, uh, facing that way, and he comes and he sits right here, and he gets in my ear, and I don't know why, but I think it's creepier that he's a prison chaplain and got that close to me. But um, and he said to me, hey, can I ask you a personal question? I said, not in that tone of voice. And um, he said, you don't wash your jeans, do you? And I said, no, Eric, I do not. He said, they've got that patina. I said, yeah. He said, I don't either. And this pair I'm wearing right now have not been washed in 12 years. <laughs> And that's when I said, I cannot live like that, man. <laughs> and, uh, um, but we were just in Nashville, and I met Noah and Rachel, my, uh, my, our kids, next door neighbor. He's one of us. I mean, one of those people that does not wash his jeans, and so they stay the same color, except with a little something extra, right? Yeah. I've noticed that things fade. Not only will denim fade if you just wear it and wear it, it fades less, uh, less quickly than if you wash it, but it's going to wear in time. And I've noticed that people's joy fades. Have you noticed that? Not other people, I mean you. Have you noticed that your joy faded? It, it's, it's not like it was when you first experienced the hopes of, of Jesus. Yeah. Uh, I think that hope, um, I think the joy fades when our hope has faded. And that's why today I've, I've been spending so much time asking you, do you remember the original hope or hopes that you had? Because I think that if you remember what it was like to be born again, that you can ask God, the Spirit of God, to reawaken your hope within you. And when that, that hope that used to be your real hope and now has maybe just become um, a footnote in your life, when that hope is reawakened, I believe that you will see joy return and bubble up in your life. Joy fades because hope fades. But hope fades usually because our connection with Jesus has faded. And listen, the, uh, the intensity of your relationship with him is going to have some seasonal ups and downs because it's a real relationship, just like your relationship with that person sitting next to you, some ups and some downs. But you also know that your relationship with that person next to you, if you do not tend to it, will fade, and the ups and downs become a down and a down, and another down and another down and another down, and you wonder if you're ever going to pull out of the nosedive, right? Yeah. Many times our joy has faded because our hope has faded, and our hope has faded because our relationship with, with Jesus has faded. And it's why he tells us you've got to connect with God again and again and again, and you've got to connect with the other disciples of Jesus because as, as your relationship with Jesus starts to fade and you start to veer a little bit, you've got friends who can say, over here, hey, over here, back on the path or occasionally can give you one of these to get you back on the path. If they've got a real, if, you know, if you've got a real close friend, they can put the boots to you once in a while when you need it. Amen? Okay, if you don't have anybody in your life who can do that, you need to be in a life group, and you need to spend enough time there that you, that you learn to love and trust people enough to let them give you the boots once in a while when you need it. Trust me, you are going to need the boots at some point in your walk with Jesus because we are faders, man. We are faders, right? Yeah. But what about this business of, what in, what in the world does that have to do with the business of actually connecting with, uh, with pre-Christian people? Just this. Um, you need to know, and hear me on this, your relationship with God is based totally and completely on grace. Again, the definition. Grace means permission from God for you to be imperfect and for him to still love you. Permission from God for you to be imperfect and him still love you. And if you give grace to anybody else, that's what you're doing, is you're, you're looking at him and going, I don't expect you to be perfect, and you can still expect me to love you every single day. That's what grace is. 
Your relationship with God is based on grace, on him knowing you're imperfect and still loving you. But hear me now, this is really important. Your relationship cannot be built into something more than an elementary faith. It cannot grow into wisdom and maturity and strength and stamina and fortitude built on grace alone. If grace is the only component of your relationship, it's going to stay, at best, elementary, childlike, and weak. At best. But the problem is, we fade. So we start this relationship that has a bunch of joy because it has a bunch of hope, and it has a bunch of hope because we're, we're so connected with Jesus in the intensity of, of, of the new birth But if we do not intentionally connect with God and reconnect with God and reconnect with his people, then there's this fade that starts to happen in our lives. You are going to have to add some things to your faith in order for it to grow strong and for you to have a durable hope. Remember, it's the hope that causes the pre-Christian people, the unbelievers, the folks who don't know him yet, to look at you and go, I want to know what it is about you that has you so stirred up and different than the rest of us. So there there comes this responsibility for the people of God to keep stoking the fires of relationship with him, to keep the connection deep and strong and pure and good and the hope of our faith visible to the world around us. And in order to do that, in order to, to to, to, for that process to take place in your life, a couple of things are going to have to happen. The first one is this. You've got to turn away and keep turning away from the things that separate you or, or drive a wedge or put an, an uneasy distance between you and God. See, when, when he offered you his grace at first, he wasn't expecting, he wasn't expecting any specific behaviors from you. He, it, it was... It was undeserved favor, right? Grace by which he saved you. But if you want that relationship to not fade, if you want it to become something that's durable and remains bright and passionate and fiery and visible, you're going to have to add some things to your life. And one of them is a resolve to quit doing the things that fade you. A resolve to, to, to quit returning to the things that make you feel far enough from God that now your hope and your joy fade. So the first is stop doing the stuff that's killing you. Let me ask you a question. If, if, you, if there was something that you were doing every day that we suddenly discovered causes cancer, would you quit it? I mean, if wearing, if wearing gray shirts caused cancer, how many of you would ever wear a gray shirt again? Nobody, right? If we found out that eating vegetables caused cancer, my life would be awesome, right? I could eat meat all day, every day, and uh, yeah. Anything, anything that I told you caused cancer, you just go, that's it, I'm done. Because I don't, I, I don't want the fade that happens to a body as they waste away from cancer. Listen, the, the things that you were doing before you came to know Christ, that 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 hit you in the heart and make you feel guilty, the things that make you wander, that haunt you, uh, those things are, are, are sucking the life out of you. See, God doesn't, doesn't give us a bunch of rules to see how faithful we are. The rules are the way he just reveals to us the things that are killing us, sucking the life out of us, fading the relationship, that connection with Jesus. Because all he wants is for you to be unfaded in your hope. It really was, it really was the intention of Christ that your connection with him would remain so strong that there is a buoyancy of spirit that, that enables and empowers you 
and motivates you to then go back to the business of demonstrating preference for the well-being of others over and above yourself. And as you do that, you will find that it will fuel this incredible hope that then fuels an incredible joy in you. And when that happens, you are going to find that the unbelievers, the pre-Christian people in your life are going, okay, now I'm, now I'm paying attention. But there's some things that are taught to us then. Jesus and the apostles taught us some things very specifically about connecting with pre-Christian people that we, the church, would never have figured out on our own. They had to be revealed to us by a command from Jesus and his apostles. And I just want you to know, I found these in the scriptures. I will share them with you. I realize I didn't write down any of the um, references right now. But if you text me, I'll send you the references. I promise you these things are found in the scriptures. And what I want to share with you right now is just a handful of things that the scriptures tell us about connecting with pre-Christian people. First of all, we connect with pre-Christian people in the hope that we can connect them with God. We're, 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 it's not a sales plan. It's not us using them. They're not our targets. It's just that life is so good when you have the hope. Life is so good when you've experienced the joy. Life is, is so um, life when you've been born again that we want that for every person on the planet. We're not going to be jerks about it. We're not going to be salesman-like about it either. But neither are we going to apologize for it. The disciples of Jesus are earnestly hoping that all of their family and friends and neighbors and coworkers get to experience what we experience. I want to... To, in order to help you understand some of the, the ways that we connect with other people. First, I want to take a look at the life of Jesus. And in uh, Jan, uh, James, James, John, in John chapter 4, yeah, not James, John chapter 4, we see that Jesus connected with a person who was not yet one of the God people. She was a woman from Samaria. She was the wrong kind of person in a number of ways, clearly not connected with the people of God. And Jesus thought that she had a dignity, even though she wasn't one of the disciples. And he treated her with dignity at the expense of his own reputation. What does that sound like? It sounds like he demonstrated a preference for her well-being over his own, doesn't it? He loved her. If you look in Mark chapter 7, you'll see that Jesus connected with a Syrophoenician woman. Anybody hear of Syria in the news lately? No good things happening in Syria? Syria? Mostly for all of human history. Okay? This woman was from the Syrian city of Phoenicia. And she came to Jesus. She was not one of the God people at all. She was one of the enemies of the God people. She came to Jesus and said, my, my daughter is possessed by an evil spirit and I want you to... to to cast out the spirit and heal her. And Jesus said, you know what? Uh, the father made it real clear to me that I am sent only to the people of Israel, only to the God people, or at least to the God people first. And that lady looked Jesus in the eye and said, I bet God has enough love and grace to go around, pal. And Jesus said, lady, I think you're right. This pre-Christian, unbelieving, outsider, changed the opinion of Jesus. And he, he granted her what she asked for. In Mark chapter 4, we read about Jesus going to the Decapolis. It's this, this city of, uh, this series of cities over on the east side of the Jordan River where let's just say that the conquest of Israel had not gone that well and now it was very few Jewish people, very few Israelis who lived there and mostly pagans of, of other ethnicities and the Jews just said, yeah, we don't go over there. That is literally the wrong side of the tracks, the wrong side of the river. And Jesus would go over there. He went over there and did a number of things. You remember when he cast the demons out of the pigs and the pigs go down and drown themselves. That happened over there. Remember the story of Jesus going uh, to a graveyard and there's a guy howling like an animal and, and running around naked and cutting himself with, with stones and, and Jesus cast the demon out of him and the guy gets dressed and says, man, Jesus, I want to follow you. And Jesus said, no, I need you to go to the, back to, to your people and take the message with you. So he went and got some people and, they, and brought them back to Jesus and the people said, yeah, we'd like you to leave, pal. And they kicked Jesus out of the Decapolis. You know what Jesus did? Went to the other side of the lake, did a few things, and he came back. Because he had room in his life for people who rejected him. You know why? Because he had a deep and abiding, lasting hope and joy. And he made room in his life for the people who hated him. 
Listen, when you've got room in your life for the people who hate you, there's a hope and a joy that becomes visible to the world around you. They will ask you why you are so nice to the people who can't stand you. And then by the time we get to the end of, of the Gospel of Matthew, we find that, uh, that Jesus just says, look, I've taught it, I've modeled it, now I'm giving you a command. Go to the people who are not yet the people of God. That's Matthew 28. Go into all the world, make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Jesus says, look, you watched me do it. You listened to me teach about it. And now I'm telling you, I have all the authority in heaven on earth. God's given it to me. And he could have told us to do 18 things. He said, one, go make disciples. Go get the people who do not have that connection with God that gives them hope and gives them joy and gives them real life. Jesus, when he had a chance to say a million other things, said, I'm going to give you one thing so you can remember it. Go get the people who do not yet know me. I told you I was going to get around to preaching that you should be out there, but not winning and not converting. Doing what? Demonstrating well-being for the disciples over ourselves and then to people outside the faith as we get an opportunity and being ready to answer the question. I like this. The apostle Paul then said, after he got the message, he, he traveled to a bunch of countries. I don't know if you've read the book of Acts and realized everywhere that Paul went. He literally did a world tour of the Mediterranean world. And um, after he'd done, oh, like three of those, he said, I realized that I had to become a little bit different in my approach everywhere I went. But here's his testimony. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. See, we're on, we're on a rescue mission. We're on a rescue mission to the people who do not yet know him because being separated from God in the here and now will make your life hell. It'll be hellish enough here and then literal hell for all of eternity. That's the consequence of not having the new life within you. And Jesus has sent his people on a mission to go get the folks who, they're, who are pre-Christian people and connect them. So Jesus modeled this, he taught it, and he commanded it. The early church clearly organized their lives around that. They, they in fact, looked around and they said, some people in the church seem to be better at that. They're specialists. All of us have the, the command from God, but some of us have special gifts for it. And they set, aside, set apart missionaries, said, you guys, you guys get out there and we'll, uh, we'll fund the mission. We'll give sacrificially to help make that happen. We'll go with you on occasion. But then for those of us who remain at home and those who are sent out, the, the Jesus and the apostles give us just a handful of guidelines for dealing with, with people who are not yet in the faith because it's very important that we follow God's path to the hope. See, if you, if you disobey these things, your heart's going to betray you, and it will suck the life out of your hope and out of your joy. It'll disappear, and the world around you will see sad sack instead of a reason to go, hey, let me on the inside. So I'm going I'm to help you with some things that are, that are, are they're, they're the cancer things that I was telling you about before, okay? You either follow these things and have abundant joy and hope, or don't follow these things, and it's going to kill your faith. Here's one. He tells us that, uh, the Apostle Paul does, tells us in 1st, I'm going to say 1 Corinthians chapter 6, to start in our homes. And in our homes, he says, as you put your home together, make sure that you do not enter into binding relationships with pre-Christian people. You've heard it put this way, perhaps. Do not be unequally yoked. If you want to read that whole passage, you'll see that, that Paul is helping a bunch of people who had no idea how to live as the followers of Jesus, as the disciples of Jesus. And one of the things he told them straight off the bat was, do not get into binding relationships with people who, do, who have not been born again because you will be going different directions in life. And if you pull too hard at two ends of one thing, you'll rip it right down the middle. And so binding relationships include romantic relationships and they include business relationships. Well, well Pastor, I already have a, a partner in, in business who isn't a follower of Jesus. 
I'm not telling you to go uh, dissolve the business today, but um, maybe, maybe we could talk about some ways that you could either be salt and light to your partner or you could begin to find a way to get obedient to what the Lord's teaching you. Because remember, cancer will kill you. And, and, and the path to being free, the path to being hopeful, the path to joy is obedience to him in these things. Pastor, but I, I have this sweetie. Yeah, I know. And, and my great aunt, she married an unbeliever and he turned into a great man. I know. There's, there's a million, there's a million um, exceptions to the rule. But what I'm telling you is what's written in God's word. He said no binding relationships with, with unbelievers. We go to them, we love them, salt and light out there, absolutely. But we do not bind ourselves into fixed, committed relationships with them. Second, he tells us in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapters 12 through 14 as he's talking about kind of the, the crazy stuff of, of Christianity, how the, the Spirit gives us gifts, and some of them are just really practical things like the gifts of help or the gifts of teaching or the gifts of administration. There are also some ecstatic gifts like the gift of tongues. Listen, the gift of tongues is a real thing. It is born by God's Spirit and given to those whom he decides. But the Apostle Paul tells us, hey, be really careful about how you do that in public worship because it freaks people out. If you go to Laura's parents' church, nobody freaks out about this because they do it every single time. But I'll tell you what, I've been there dozens of times, and every single time they do it in accordance with his word where somebody then interprets what was heard by, a, by the gift of the same spirit. But the apostle Paul's basically, can we, can we get past tongues for a minute and just say, here's what he's teaching us. Church should not be so weird that the pre-Christian people run for their lives instead of connecting with us. Listen, the gospel is difficult enough to believe. We need to make sure that the way that we conduct ourselves when we are gathered in these ways is warm and welcoming and winsome to people who just want to know God. So let's make sure that we don't freak people out by the way we do what we do. We have a no freak out policy in the kingdom. I've told you about that before. We don't freak out and we don't cause other people to freak out. And then finally this one. It's from Ephesians chapter 2. Here's what he tells us about Maybe it's the most important thing about our connection with pre-Christian people. Feel this. He said, you used to be one of the outsiders. He says, remember, you used to be one of the outsiders. You were one of the people who didn't know the promises. You didn't know any of the hopes. You didn't have any of it. Because you didn't have any of that hope, there was no joy welling up within you. And because of that, Nobody ever came to you saying, give me what you got, man. Because what you had wasn't worth having. You used to be one of the pre-Christian people. You used to be one of the strangers. You used to be one of the outsiders. He said, don't you ever forget that. Because then you'll have compassion for people who don't have hope. And when you, when you sit here enjoying the fullness of, of the riches of relationship with God, there will be something in you that looks and remembers that other people don't have that yet. And it will make you say, I really enjoyed worship today, but I gotta get out of here because I've got this nephew, see, who doesn't know Jesus. I've got this coworker, see, who has no hope at all. I've got this next door neighbor who seems to be losing her grip. Ephesians 2, you should read it today. After he talks about the grace, the, un, the undeserved favor, the permission to be imperfect and still be loved by God, he goes on to say, and God has some good things for you to do then. He says, you go to do them, just remember, you were once one of the outsiders. You were one of the people, no hope, no joy, but you have some today. I saw it, because even with heavy hearts, grieving two deaths in our church family this week, you were praising him. Some of you had your hands in the air. Some of you smiles on your faces. Some of you clap. And there were even some Nazarenes that when I said something about, you know, saying some, some line about him turning mourning to dancing, some of you had your back end doing this just a little bit. There's joy in you. And there's other people who have none. 
No song at the end, no great big emotional thing. I'm just gonna lift my hands like, stand up. I'm just gonna lift my hands like this. You know the big blessing that I wanna give you at the end of it? Here's what it is. Get out of here. There are pre-Christian people who do not yet know you. Go love on one another. Get close enough that, that you can actually demonstrate preference for the well-being of other disciples of Jesus and do that in a way that gets noticed by other people. Experience the full joy of belonging to God and to the people of God. And so may you become salt and light to people who have none. Grace and peace to you today. Amen.